This is Gene Therapy for Hemophilia, Dream or Reality, a show on behalf of the Canadian Hemophilia Society. Here's your host, David Page. My great honor today to introduce our guest for, for the podcast, Dr. David Lillycrap, Professor, Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and Canada Research Chair in Molecular Hemostasis. Dr. Lillycrap is world-renowned for his research in hemophilia gene therapy and has been a great ally in Canadian Hemophilia Society's educational work with the community. Today, he will help us understand what gene therapy is and how it works. Welcome, Dr. Lillycrap. David, it's wonderful to see you again. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me to take part in this uh, podcast series on what is a very timely and in- interesting subject matter. Dr. Lillycrap, a first challenge for you. Can you describe in a hundred words or less how gene therapy for hemophilia works? So what I'm going to do now is try to um, condense what has been 30 years of work in 100 words. So gene therapy for hemophilia involves delivering a normal copy of a clotting factor gene, factor 8 or 9, to the liver of patients with hemophilia, and the liver will then produce the clotting factor, factor 8 or factor 9, to treat the hemophilia effectively. And and how is that gene delivered? So one of the main components of gene therapy is a delivery with what we call a vector. And a vector is really just the delivery system which takes one of the clotting factor genes, uh, factor eight or factor nine, and delivers it to the cells where eventually the clotting factor will be made. And in 2023, the cells that we're delivering these genes to uh, are the liver cells and a particular type of liver cell called a hepatocyte, which makes up about uh, 80% of the mass of the liver organ. And you mentioned a a vector. This is the the adeno-associated vector. It sounds a little dangerous, uh, you know, a viral vector. Can it transmit disease? Yeah, so the, the best way of delivering nucleic acids, so bits of genetic material, is to steal information from viruses. Viruses have evolved over billions of years to deliver their genes into cells. And so gene therapists steal information from viruses, in this case, the adeno-associated virus, AAV, to be the delivery vector, the delivery vehicle. Can this be harmful? We know that even the normal type of virus, AAV, doesn't cause disease in humans. And gene therapists manipulate the virus to make it not a virus. So when we inject vectors, we're not injecting viruses. We're injecting a little bits of virus which help us deliver to the cells of the body. And and the gene itself, the factor eight or, or nine gene, where does that come from? It ultimately comes from humans, but it's made by synthetic processes called a recombinant DNA. So many people uh, perhaps listening to the podcast know that we treat hemophilia now a lot with recombinant clotting factors. And the, the factor eight and nine that's used in the recombinant proteins is the same that we use for gene therapy, that we deliver to the cells of the hemophilia person. We know from the clinical trials that uh, only adults are, are eligible uh, at the moment for, for, for hemophilia gene therapy. But there are some gene therapies approved in Canada, which are given to children. So there, for example, is the Zolgensma, which treats uh, spinal muscular atrophy in, in babies, and, and Luxterna, which treats uh, an inherited condition causing blindness. They both use an AAV vector, similar to the one used in, in the hemophilia gene therapy. But, and these therapies are given to, to young children and even babies. Why can't hemophilia gene therapy be used in children? So that's a very um, interesting and a very important question. The principal reason is that when we deliver with an AAV vector to cells, the vast majority of that vector enters the nucleus of cells, but it doesn't get integrated into the host genome, into the chromosomes of the cells of the, uh, of the patient. So 95, 98% of the the vector that gets into the cell stays outside of the chromosomes in structures that we call episomes, episomes. When a cell divides, it will lose some of those episomes because the division takes the chromosomes to two daughter cells, 
but the episomes are diluted and uh, kicked out during cell division. So as a as an infant gets bigger and their liver gets bigger and bigger, we we know actually that a liver becomes about twelve times the size of what it is in an infant to an adult. You will lose significant numbers of the vectors. I should just say very quickly that. Just a few days ago, I presented some uh, new information that we have in the dog model showing that um, relatively young dogs can be treated effectively with AAV. So it, it, I think we're not saying that in the future, it might be possible to treat children with this uh, treatment. And have the gene therapies and these other conditions, uh, these two conditions approved already in Canada, have they been successful? Well, the issue of Zolgensma is that SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, is, a, is, a, is not a nice disease at all. It's a very bad disease for neonates to have. So this is a bad disease. In the trials so far, the gene therapy looks as though it's producing some improvement. And then the, the blindness disorder, I think, has been treated successfully. Of course, the eye is a very different process because it, it's, it's privileged and uh, isolated away from other things in the body, like the immune system. Going back to hemophilia gene therapy, how, how is it administered? It's administered by a, a single intravenous infusion, just like a factor infusion. So most gene therapies are infused over maybe one to two hours at most. Uh, patients are often uh, asked to stay overnight, although I know in some centers they go out the same day that they get the infusion. So the, the, the delivery of a gene therapy vector is relatively uncomplicated. It's just like a regular intravenous injection. And how quickly does it take effect? You normally begin to see the expression of factor eight or nine from the vector in about two to four weeks. So you should not expect to see changes in the first week after gene therapy delivery. But but by one month, there is usually uh, an amount of factor that's uh, identified in the blood if you took a normal blood sample. And the, and the levels then continue to increase uh, in humans up to a peak at about six months after delivery of the intravenous infusion. And is the factor eight or, or nine that is produced just like a person's normal factor eight or nine? Does it, does it work just as well? It works just as well. We know that the therapy is or the, the treatments are a little different because, for example, we don't make factor eight in the liver cells, in the hepatocytes. We make them in other body cell types. And so although the liver cells are able to make factor eight and the factor eight works very well, it isn't exactly the same as factor eight in a, in a normal situation in humans. That's important to remember because we may get on to discuss in just a while, it is factor eight and factor nine gene therapy similar? Do they work similarly well? And the answer to that is actually n no, because factor nine is made in hepatocytes, the cells where we carry out gene therapy. And so we think that those hepatocytes are more capable, they're more um, familiar with making factor nine, and that has made factor nine gene therapy easier and that's what we've seen in some of the early phase clinical studies. What short-term complications can arise from, from this therapy, and how are they treated? So let's begin with the, the very short term during the infusion. Most of these infusions have, have been carried out without any complications, although maybe 5 to 10% of patients may have something that needs you to slow down the infusion rate. But the infusion itself, the delivery of the vector, is usually uncomplicated. The biggest issue that's been faced with AAV therapy for hemophilia has been a, a transient upset of the liver, something we refer to as hepatotoxicity, so some unhappiness in the liver cells. And this usually occurs somewhere between two and four months after the infusion. Uh, we can detect this by doing a blood test, a liver test, which says that some of the liver cells are leaking or possibly uh, dying. And the treatment for this is to give a form of suppression of the immune system. We usually give steroids, and the steroids are given for anywhere between uh, one and several months. This is an issue. We actually still don't really understand why this is occurring. And the therapy is usually successful, but it sure would be nice if we understood this better and our treatment could be more focused. But anyway, that's, that's the principal complication during the first year. And after that, 
there are no further complications that we see unless you wanted to talk about sort of longer term things. But I guess we, we don't really know long term yet. We haven't don't have enough, uh, I guess, experience to know what happens in the long term. Yeah. So the longest we've followed factor nine gene therapy is now out to about 12 years. Uh, there's a small cohort of about 10 patients treated in the UK and London who are now out to about 12 or 13 years still expressing factor nine. And for factor eight, the longest follow up is about six years. So we certainly don't have long term. But the thing I should just quickly mention is that although um, a few minutes ago I said that the this vector doesn't get into the host chromosomes, uh, because you give a large amount of the vector, there is integration into the host chromosomes, the host genome, and that potentially could cause issues down the road. But nothing has happened. Uh, someone might say, well, could that produce cancer in me, that, that there is no evidence of that happening um, in any way with AAV. But it's something that we should just keep in mind as a possible, a possible long-term problem. So clearly people need to be monitored immediately after the administration of gene therapy. How was that done in, in the weeks and months following the injection? The follow-up is pretty intensive for the first few months. Uh, normally, you would be expected to give blood samples on a weekly basis for the first, I'd say, four or five months to look for this liver change that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So blood samples are required regularly for the early to middle phase of the first year. And then the blood samples would then be spaced out sort of monthly. Beyond that, beyond the blood samples, seeing a physician, asking how well you are, there are no other imaging or other investigations that are usually carried out uh, during that first year. And beyond that, you would be expected to see your comprehensive care treaters, have annual checkups, and maybe some other imaging, like maybe an ultrasound of the, uh, the liver occasionally. But really, it's principally during the first three or four months that the follow-up is fairly intensive. And I assume these, these blood tests would, would measure factor eight or factor nine levels. They measure factor eight or nine. They measure this liver enzyme that we measure. And it also would look for the presence of inhibitors. And again, I can say confidently that we've seen no evidence of inhibitor formation following any gene therapy in hemophilia patients up to now. Gene therapy does not appear to induce inhibitor formation, which of course is an important thing to point out. And what kind of monitoring would, would occur over, over the long term, like years after the administration? I think that following up with your comprehensive care centers in the usual annual way, I think that you should not lose contact with your treaters, even if you're not in injecting yourself with uh, exogenous uh, factor eight or nine. Maybe occasionally um, liver ultrasounds to make sure that the liver structure is, is fine. And then other routine blood work, I think, is what you would expect to, to carry out. Dr. Lillycrab, gene therapy for hemophilia has been a dream for four decades. Do you now consider it to be a reality? It's working. It is a reality. And, and David, as you know, I've worked in the area of gene therapy, principally in preclinical studies, for about 30 years. And it was always my dream that I would still be working and contributing at the time this happened. And this is a reality. It can still get better. I think we're at the current stage of Hemophilia gene therapy 1.0. And I think in the years to come, it will get even better than it is now, but it's working. Before we end, is there anything else that you would like our listeners to know? I think between us, we've come to a conclusion. This is something that's been a long time coming. There's been an, an enormous amount of work carried out to make sure that this is safe and eventually effective. You must not think that gene therapy occurred because of work that happened uh, in the last five years. It's taken 30, 35 years to reach this point, and that should provide us with a lot of confidence that what's happening now with the approved products is safe and is going to be effective in most patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Nildi Krapp. We really appreciate you always being ready to educate and inform our community. Uh, for more information on gene therapy, we invite you to check out other podcasts in this series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, Dream or Reality including one called Hemophilia Gene Therapy Clinical Trial Results, in which Dr. Lidcraft returns to explore in more detail what might be expected from gene therapy in Hemophilia A and B. For more information, we invite you to check out more episodes in this series, Hemophilia Gene Therapy, 
dream, or reality. This podcast series was made possible by an unrestricted educational grant from Pfizer Canada to the Canadian Hemophilia Society.